matter with it. What's the matter? I don't know. Okay, that works. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, I hope you can see it. So, um, I'll begin with the description of the general method, and then I'll describe the results which I am going to discuss, okay? So first of all, <clears throat> I think the universal, the, the, the argument shift method is not something universally known, so I'll probably begin with the classical version of the argument shift method, not quantized one. Um, let M be a Poisson manifold, so it is equipped with a Poisson by vector pi. Uh, um, and um, as such, it, um, its algebra of functions is equipped with um, additional structure called the Poisson bracket, namely for any two functions f and g, the smooth functions, of course, on the manifold M. The Poisson bracket f and g with respect to this by vector pi, I will sometimes use sub pi to denote this particular Poisson bracket is equal to the pairing of the Poisson, sorry, by vector pi with the differentials of f and g. Differentials are one forms by vector is, uh, well, two vectors, so we can plug in two one forms into one by vector and we get just, just a function. So this uh, uh, bracket verifies the usual properties. It is skew symmetric. It is uh, to verify his Leibniz rule with respect to both arguments. And also, if uh, pi verifies an additional condition, which is expressed in terms of uh, Schouten brackets, pi comma pi is equal to zero, it is Schouten bracket. Uh, then, the Latin, the, the, the um, Poisson bracket verifies Jacobi identity. Sorry. Uh, um, but what in particular case is when um, phi is equal to the inverse of a, of a symplectic form. In this case, when there is when pi is equal to the inverse of a, of <clears throat> a symplectic form, we know that uh, if f Poisson commutes with every g, so it's equal to zero for all g, then f should be equal to the constant, to a constant. In general, however, this is not the case. And uh, there appears um, a pretty large, depending on the structure, by center, which I call Poisson's center of, of m, or z, z sub pi, z sub pi of m, um, of which consists of functions which Poisson commute with anything. Such functions are usually called Casimir functions, or just Casimirs. <clears throat> So let us now speak about a generic Poisson manifold. It is a Poisson manifold with a non-trivial center. Uh, then one can ask what other commutative subalgebras, except for the center, one can find inside uh, the, the, the algebra of functions of M. When I say commutative, it means commutative for respect to the Poisson bracket. Um, it turns out that there exists, um, well, there, there, there are, nowadays there exist several different methods of constructing such functions. 
Um, some of them are pretty um, universal. And one of such universal methods is so-called argument shift method. Namely, <clears throat> so let me open the next slide. Namely, if psi is a vector field on M, which verifies one additional property, uh, the lead derivative along psi of pi need not be zero, but the second lead derivative, sorry, that is L psi squared of pi should vanish. Then uh, the, the following is true. For every f and g in the center, in the Poisson center of M, the k-fold derivative of f in the direction of psi will Poisson commute with l-fold derivative of g in the same direction for all k and l. One can ask, uh, I mean, I mean the, the condition that uh, this is not zero is um, not very important because of course, uh, the same will be true for, uh, it, 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 well, the same, the same result will be true if uh, L psi of pi will be zero at once. However, in this case, in this case, uh, psi of f will always be again in the center for all central functions, for all Casimir functions f. So it doesn't give us anything new. However, in general situation, these, uh, <clears throat> these functions, f and xi k of f and xi l of g, are no more central. They commute only with each other, but not with something else. Uh, <clears throat> um, I, well, I don't know if it is really worth the proof, but let me just give you explanation how this can be proved. Uh, the, the, the exact proof is very simple, but just so just sketch it. The proof consists of considering equations which you obtain by commuting uh, and by, by applying psi to the equation um, of the form the commutator of f and g is equal to zero. And of course, this commutator, will, the psi of this commutator will also vanish, but this commutator, but this, this, this sorry, this um, derivative will be equal to the sum of the form sorry um, minus f and g respect not to pi but to pi sub psi so pi sub psi is the lead derivative of pi. Now we can do this repeatedly several times, applying it to various co uh, corollaries of this um, equation. And then by simple com com combining the results, we'll obtain that all these um, commutators actually vanish for all k and l. That's some, some very simple um, exercise which you can give to a first year student. And moreover, this exercise is very, very general. We really don't uh, even need the uh, fact that, that brackets verify Jacobi identity. Nor, we do need, uh, nor do we need uh, that Xi is actually a derivative. Xi can be anything, uh, a, map of, uh, a linear map of any uh, nature, even not linear, I believe, will do. And uh, even non-bilinear map, um, instead of the bracket, will do also in this case. But uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, could could we control the um, some sh such questions as maximality of uh, the family of yes, this? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, so. In these situations, one can prove that by this, in this method, in this way, we obtain maximal commutative subalgebra. Uh, I'm sorry. If uh, xi is uh, uh, is a derivation <clears throat> is in is an integral of a by vector, it this is not true. Sorry, what? Uh, if uh, the first derivative, lead derivative. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I said in many cases, but not in all cases. Ah. Yeah, in many cases. <laughs> okay. Well, for sure that this is the case. 
um, for my next several next example, which I'm going to give. Um, this is the case for the particular choice of um, Poisson algebra, namely, so example, continue with backing, exact example, take M to be just the uh, co-joint representation of a Lie algebra G. Then as one knows, G is um, equipped, G star is equipped with the Poisson structure, which uh, is um, defined in probably the simplest way to define it um, by saying that coordinates in G star can be identified with elements in G, coordinate functions in G star are just elements in G. And hence, we just define the Poisson bracket of these of two coordinates, xi and xj, as just the commutator in the sense of the Lie algebra, of the commutator of the corresponding elements in the Lie algebra. OK? Um, if um, x1 for xn is a basis, in G. So that we have the commutation relation like this. Right? Then in the corresponding coordinates, pi is given by the formula C i j k times x small x k d dxi tends to d dxj. As you see, the coefficients of this bivector are linear. And hence, for every constant vector field, psi given by certain coefficients xi i d over d x i um, verifies the condition which I list, which I wrote at previous slide. That is to say, the square of xi applied to pi vanishes. Hence, we obtain a large commutative subalgebra in S G. Which is called sometimes argument shift method, argument shift algebra, and usually listed and denoted by a sub psi energy. That's classical theory. Now, what I'm going to talk about is um, an attempt to obtain quantum counterpart of this algebra, namely, as one knows. No, we have a theorem. Uh, excuse me, just, uh, just one uh, remark. Uh, do you know uh, an example different from uh, an example of this generalized uh, argument shift method uh, different from uh, the construction uh, uh, which, uh, go, uh, which comes from the theory of Lie algebra? So I, I confess that I don't know any natural example of this sort. One can actually try to um, to construct something, but in an artificial way, because actually uh, one can obtain a similar result from uh, what they call uh, Magri induction method. So when I can actually, if you have a two, um, two um, a compatible Poisson brackets, mm -hmm. you can add formally an additional coordinate and then take a derivation in direction of this coordinate. What you obtain will be more or less the same thing you obtain by Magri induction. So uh, I must confess that no natural example, which does not reduce in immediately to something like that, I don't know. 
And in this case, there is also a Magrin induction lurking behind. So probably um, one can say that uh, this method is a, is a particular is a, some particular case of Magrin induction. Although, well, in literature, these two methods are usually uh, discriminated. Okay. Okay. So theorem, which I believe everybody knows, is that. Um, if you take universal envelope in algebra of G, um, which I recall is just the <laughs> tensor algebra of G quotient by relation that X tensor Y minus Y tensor X is equal to the commutator of X and Y, right? And quotient out the filtration in this algebra, there's a natural filtration where FK of UG is the image of the tensors of degree not greater than k inside this tensor algebra under the natural projection. Um, then the associated graded algebra of UG is isomorphic to the symmetric algebra of G. So <clears throat> now if we take uh, algebra a sub psi inside this algebra, we can look for some algebra a sub psi head inside UG that covers this a sub psi by with respect to this natural projection. And the question is if we can find is it possible? Sorry, to find a head sub psi such that a head sub psi is commutative. That's the question which was posed by Windrock in the uh, beginning of 1990s, I believe, somewhere around about 1995. about this. Uh, uh, um, one can pose a little bit more particular question, which will be the principal question for me now, a variation of Binder equation. Is it possible to find a um, reasonable operation Reasonable means something which you can compute by hand. On UG, such that um, operation, let's denote it by Xi hat, such that Xi hat of F, Kth, Kth iteration of Xi hat of F, uh, sorry, of F, um, yeah, psi, kth iteration of psi hat applied to F, right? Commutes with the Lth iteration of the same operator psi hat applied to G for any K and L and for all central F and G in the center of UG. This, this, this question is pretty well based because as one knows, the center of UG is isomorphic to the center of um, the or the Poisson center of G. Poisson center of G star. <clears throat> Both consist of uh, G invariant elements. If I use G capital to denote the one connected group associated with the Lie algebra G, then both spaces consist of G invariant elements in the algebras. Um, and the symmetrization map, sigma, 
sends uh, the right hand side to the left hand side and is a linear isomorphism. I believe everybody knows what is symmetrization. Right. Uh, moreover, one knows that the floor is the floor formula provides us with a modification of symmetrization. As you know, it sigma sub d d stands for the floor, uh, um, which is actually an isomorphism of algebras from S of G sub G capital to U G sub G capital. So <clears throat> it is natural to assume that one can transfer <laughs> psi well from SG to UG using either sigma or sigma sub D or something else so that The result holds. The, the 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 construction is the same. The constructions construction <clears throat> we need. Uh, well, uh, it's true. So that the formula which I'm looking for this assumption is verified. Unfortunately, if you just take this, um, for instance, usual sigma, if you just take sigma and use it to transfer psi from, I think it's other way around, from symmetric algebra to the universal enveloping algebra. So first to take map from UG to SG and you take differentiation with psi and then you take the reverse map sigma to UG so this if you use this as psi fed then this will be barely computable at all So therefore, well, I mean, no bad, not computable. I mean that if you try to write down psi hat of the product of f and g, and of course the first two terms will look like the usual Leibniz rule, which you should assume, which you should actually expect from the very beginning, but then there will be an infinite sum of correction terms. Psi hat one of f, psi hat two of g. For every f and g in universal enveloping algebra. So this um, is not something easy to deal with. Uh, as far as the floor isomorphism is concerned, well, um, to be honest, I haven't yet tried it completely, but I don't believe it um, will be much better than um, this psi because the floor isomorphism is actually isomorphism only on the centers. Outside of the center, it, it behaves pretty wildly. There is a small, there is an, another subalgebra where it behaves well, and I assume that it can be used there to extend um, well to this subalgebra. Um, um, but I'm not sure that on the general elements in UG one can compute something reasonably good, reasonably easily with the help of Duflois-isomorphism. Okay. So therefore, 
I am suggesting um, another construction. I'm going to suggest another construction of this map Xi hat based on so-called quasi differentials uh, introduced earlier by Gurevich, Piatov, and Saponov. Here is a definition. There are different ways to define these operations. Some of these uh, ways are actually very geometric. Some are pretty algebraic. So I would prefer this, uh, this easiest one because it is just axiomatic. I mean, axiomatic methods method is much easier in many cases than anything you can do <laughs> with some, well, geometric, in some geometric way. So definition is the following. Definition or probably definition slash proposition. Uh, I think that's kind of mathematical genre introduced by Grothendieck in 1960s. There you see. So yeah, I forgot to say that from now on, I'm assuming um, just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, that g is equal to gln. One can actually introduce a similar differential operator to the differential quasi-differential operator, quasi-derivations for other uh, Lie algebras as well, but this is the simplest case, so I'll probably just stick to this case, and that's all. So for once and for all, we assume that g is just gln. So the proposition is the following. They exist, exist um, a collection of linear operations d i j hat on u j l n from u j l n to u j l n. Which verifies the which <clears throat> verifies the following set of um, equ equ equations. First, d i j hat applied to sorry to the unit to the scalars uh, is equal to zero. Two, d i j hat applied to the generator, I'll denote the generator of GLN by E I J. So if we apply D I J to E P Q, we shall get something very natural, I Q and Delta pj. So it is just zero or one, depending on whether the coefficient, the indices coincide or not. And the third part of this identity is the most interesting one, is the Leibniz rule, modified Leibniz rule. Which looks like dij hat applied to the product of f and g is equal to dij hat of f times g plus f dij hat of g. And uh, then we have plus, actually, well, there are two different types of positive derivations, but I believe this is probably more convenient. One um, sum over k from one to n djk hat of f D uh, I K hat of G. Um, um, now this um, the, the the advantage of having this formula is that now we can compute virtually uh, action of uh, this D I J on virtually any element in the universal enveloping algebra. Uh, <clears throat> then therefore it's much easier than it's much simpler than the formula for um with the same the similar formula for um the something you, you obtain by transferring the differentiation from 
um, uh, as GLN. Uh, the proof of this proposition is pretty straightforward. Gush, I'm sorry. Is, the, is it right that uh, uh, for the case of the Barrel, uh, Lisa Bell, Jabra, no. uh, 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 the space of uh, quest de de derivation defined uh, by this formula uh, reproduces the complete universal enveloping for the, uh, for the uh, GLN? Sorry, I don't, don't really understand here. Well, can you um, didn't, didn't really understand the, the equation? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if we add a uh, quest derivation to the generators of the Barrel subalgebra, yeah, if you apply it to the generators, if you if you um, if you take f and g from Barrel subalgebra, is this what you mean? Yes, f and g g, g from Barrel subalgebra. And we uh, add to these generators the quest derivation, we obtain the complete uh, universal enveloping algebra of J. Never thought about this in this way, to be sure. Um, uh, uh, my question is related with the construction of the uh, Dreamfield double for the Barrel subalgebra. Well, um, yeah, I never thought about this. May, it might be interesting, yeah, just, just to. Uh, the, the 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 importance of Borel subalgebra cannot be overestimated in this business, I believe, uh, because actually the flow isomorphism extends to something to the algebra which I announced. It is it's it's algebra found by Ginsburg in 1982, I believe, and um, it is defined with the help of Borel subalgebra, right? So I really believe that Borel subalgebra might be interesting here. Moreover, I would say that if f and g are not from Borel but from nilpotent subalgebra. I mean, F and G are in the universal enveloping of the nilpotent subalgebra, for say, for instance, yes. upper triangular, right? Uh -huh. F and G in the universal enveloping above a triangular. Strictly upper triangular, which is inside UGLN. And of course, this last term will just vanish here. You see, because uh, either one or the other of this will be, will be um, will be outside of this subalgebra. Either J is less than K, or K is less than I. You see? No, this is not clear. Okay, it might be. Um, okay. okay. Yeah. Please continue. We'll yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're all right, but yeah, I believe that. This might be the, the, the really the important observation, but I believe that. Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. Sorry for Excuse being me. a little bit <laughs> in a hurry because I need to. I know that you only have one hour time limit, and I already wasted a couple of minutes in the beginning because of my and in, 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 inability to find proper space. Sorry for this. So the proof is pretty simple and very straightforward. I just stress that there are two important steps, not one, but two important steps. First step, you observe that uh, Leibniz rule allows you to extend, allows to extend D hat IJ, the set of, the, the set of maps D hat IJ to the tensor algebra of GLN. And that's not so um, trivial because actually this additional term should, should be such that the sum of these three terms verifies uh, the co-associativity assumption. So not any additional term, not any well correction term is good enough for us. Um, but that's easy. In a second, we just check, just check that uh, 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 D I J hat, when you apply it to the element in the ideal, that is to say E I E P Q E R S minus 
delta P S E Q R plus delta Q R E S P vanishes. And then it is. Then it will mean that the ideal which you need to kill in order to project from the tensor algebra into the universal enveloping algebra is uh, preserved by these operations. And it is sufficient for you to, to understand, to, to get the result. It's not the unique way to define these uh, partial uh, quasi derivations. Uh, the other ways are more geometric and more algebraic. One of these ways is the following, which I'm not going to prove right now, but it is, again, it's pretty simple. Remark. Uh, if we consider the matrix D hat of quasi partial positive derivations, D i j hat, just the matrix, um, matrix for the operator from UGLN to matrices with coefficients in UGLN. And this operator, this operator, Will, <clears throat> can be defined as follows. Um, take the sum of d hat and the identity. Identity matrix, let's put it this way. And let's note it by theta. Then theta is equal to the following composition. You take UGLN and co-multiply it to obtain GLN Cross GLN. Then you take the representation in the first uh, or in the second, doesn't matter because it's called commutative, in the first and the second leg of this tensor product, and you end up in the matrices with coefficients in UGLN. When I say representations, I mean the tautological, trivial representation, the one which is which comes from the identification of GLN with matrices. It turns out that, so so we can now define d hat as the difference between theta and identity. And this now works for arbitrary universal enveloping algebra, not just with JLN. And so I believe that's, that can be used as a definition in many other cases. Um, okay. Um, the, the, the main conjecture, which I... I'm talking about is that if we take arbitrary scalar matrices, uh, sorry, arbitrary a matrix, a numerical matrix psi of coefficients, and take the operator psi hat equal to the sum over i and j psi i j d hat i j as an operator from UGLN to UGLN, then this operator will uh, <clears throat> verify the condition which I listed above. There exist different um, uh, evidences that this conjecture is true. Well, first of all, direct computations in low dimensions, where you can do this everything by head, by hand. Show that the, the that this conjecture uh, holds. Well, at least up to. Um, well, degree five, at least. Then one can write down an explicit formula for the action of, let us do this like this, uh, the operation d hat on 
very special choice of elements in the universal envelope in algebra. Namely, take the trace of the matrix of generators to the power k. So E, yeah, E is the matrix composed of the generators of GLN. So there is an explicit formula for the result of this operation. which allows one to prove that at least the first derivations psi hat of any central element, a couple of central elements, F and G, will commute. And the third, um, uh, and the third thing I'm going to talk about now, about today, is that if you take a very special... Um, no, oh, gosh, I'm sorry, I, I, I do not understand, understand uh, the second uh, uh, statement. So, I mean, the second statement is one can prove that the first derivations of any two central elements, the central elements, do actually commute. How oh, it's related with the matrix E? I mean, uh, for matrix E, we will use matrix E later. Um, mm -hmm. But now I just explained that this result follows from some explicit formulas oh, mm -hmm. for this particular choice of elements. Okay, okay. You take these elements, traces of EK, one knows that every element in the center is a polynomial of these traces. And then using these explicit formulas for the traces, one can show that these two elements will commute. So now, if one takes another collection of generators, standard collection of generators, I denote them by I hat I hat K of E. And they are the symmetrizations. of the kth coefficient of the characteristic polynomial, universal characteristic polynomial. Then, for every P and Q natural numbers, psi hat to the power P I K hat of E will commute with psi hat to the power Q of I hat L of E for all K and L. So that's... Um, a recent result, which have, is not yet published, but I'm just preparing a text. So any um, remarks and observations which you can suggest, I'll appreciate them. So here is a sketch of the proof of this result. I barely have 10 minutes for this. Let me be very, <clears throat> it will be very sketchy now. It is based on the following old theorem of Tarasov. Which claims that if you take usual vector field Xi on G hat, sorry, G star vector field. The one which we be sorry in the GLN star, which the one which we began with. So xi is just the sum 
of the partial derivatives with coefficients xi of usual partial derivatives xi ij d over dx <clears throat> ij sorry i j All right and take the symmetrizations of psi to the power p of i k of e now e is the the matrix of generators of symmetric algebra of GLN. Then these symmetrizations will also commute. The proof is based on very delicate um, combinatoric analysis of the structure of this elements and also on a theorem by uh, Alshansky and I don't remember who was the second guy uh, Varchenko or Muchin, I don't remember uh, which describes the uh, elements invariant with respect to subgroup in the universal in the universal envelope in algebra <clears throat> and um, so my uh, the claim the claim which was announced at the previous page, let me note with double star, follows from the following observation. Sorry. from the remark that psi <clears throat> at applied to um, an element centralization of this psi usual psi to the power p of i k of e so many one two three right parentheses um, is equal to a linear combination all this of symmetrizations of psi p uh, plus one of i k minus j That's the main result, actually. So, of course, it means that now, in a particular, it follows from this observation that the algebra we obtain will be the same algebra okay. as uh, <clears throat> introduced by Tarasov. Okay, so let me sketch the proof of this result. So first, we um, consider the, com the, the composition um, where, where there is a map theta from UGLN to the matrices with coefficients in UGLN. Sorry, there is, it is noisy here. I'm speaking from the department room. Then we can take the composition of theta <laughs> with <laughs> desymmetrization map. Um, sorry, sorry, with the symmetrization map from SGLN here. And then desymmetrization <laughs> to the matrices of the coefficients in SGLN. 
it turns out that the composition of this sort is equal to the exponent of the vector of the matrix of partial derivations on on uh, on SGLN. Okay, that's the first observation. It is based on uh, the description of theta in terms of the compositions, which I described earlier. And the second observation is step two, the final step today, is that for any element i, k, of the any coefficient i, k of e of the characteristic polynomial, of the universal characteristic polynomial. Then um, for any IK coefficient, uh, um, we have the following formula. If we take the usual partial derivative, dij, djk of i, Alpha, uh, no, let's put alpha just to preserve K for something different of E. And it is equal to DJJ or DIK of I alpha. So combining these two results, one and two, we prove this uh, linear combination lemma. And this linear combination actually <clears throat> means that the elements do actually commute. As, let me conclude, uh, con uh, uh, complete my talk, conclude my talk with the following remark. Even though even though the center of the universal enveloping algebra, is just a free algebra with generators sigma of, well, let me use the i hat, i hat one of e, i hat k, I get n of e. And for every element of this sort, we know this result, that psi hat k, or i hat <clears throat> p of e commutes with Xi L I had Q of E. We cannot still still cannot derive the fact that for any two elements F and G in the center, we still have the same commutation relation. That Xi had cat of F commutes with psi hat L of G for all K and L. And that's due to the fact that the Leibniz rule is a little different from the usual one. So there is no direct corollary. One cannot derive directly the second formula from the first formula. And in fact, uh, even the second derivative of, even the second derivative of the trace, sorry, trace e to the power k is quite a complicated and can be derived, described with a, with a very complicated formula only. So I just don't know whether one can do something um, in this direction by straightforward computation or one needs some very delicate uh, analysis of the structure of the universal enveloping algebra. Um, what kind of analysis, I really don't know. Um, I think that's um, the end of my talk today.
Uh, Gush, thank you very much. It was very interesting personally, personally for me. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, okay, if not, uh, uh, I have I have some questions. So the first one, uh, what kind of the characteristic polynomial you use in the quantum case? The column? Yeah, I just, I, no, no, no. In quantum case, I use the usual characteristic polynomial. Actually, in quantum case, I just take, um, so this I had, um, K of E, they define defined as follows. You just take the usual characteristic polynomial, a characteristic polynomial in SGLN. You see, you take in SGLN the same characteristic polynomial. Ah, uh, okay. And you just symmetrize all the elements of this polynomial. So just symmetrize it. Okay. It's neither one, neither colon nor row. It's just the symmetrization of the usual. Ah, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, uh, the second and very important question: uh, Does this quantization coincide with uh, some known quantum? I told, as I explained that um, the, the, I think that there is a theorem by Tarasov which actually claims that if this algebra exists, if algebra does exist, then it is unique. There is a unique algebra A hat Xi, which covers this, as far as I can remember. Um, and even if it is not the case, because I didn't, didn't find the uh, paper by Tarasov to which people refer, I haven't yet seen it myself. So yeah, I just trust people who have seen it. Even, even if I make this um, caveat, I still claim, I still, it is still evident that the construction, that the elements which I construct, they coincide with linear combinations of the elements that Karasov construct. And so they they give you the same algebra eventually. It is just some... But for example, for the three-point garden model or for the uh, complete symmetrized uh, total system, does this uh, construction produce the same result? As far as the Gaden, uh, I think it is it does it does produce the same result. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Yeah. And I I, I think that it is uh, completely not the problem that you always substitute the same e because e is not a function; it is a generating function of functions. Yes. It is a lux yeah. operator if you want. Yeah, but therefore sometimes people use l instead of e. So I just use E because okay. for some personal reasons. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay. Okay. If there are no, uh, no other question, um, uh, we stop now. Um, see you. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the invitation as well. Also, and I, uh, yeah.